Thank you, guys. Good morning, everyone. How are we doing today? So good to see all of you in this room, and we have many people joining us online. We are sorry you couldn't make it out today, but we're glad that we can still worship together. We are one church in many rooms. Can we just welcome those online today that are part of our service? And we have visitors in the house today. How do we feel, church, about our visitors that are here? Welcome, welcome, welcome. We are so excited to be together, and if you could not tell, we have a lot of stuff ready to go this fall, right? So we've got to be ready to go. I I love fall season in the life of a church, and maybe it's part of just living in Canada, but even as I look out today, there are people that you're back from vacationing or back from maybe living at the cottage for the summer. And it's just an exciting time in the life of the church. And I'm really, really looking forward to it. Is there anyone else looking forward to this fall? Come on, we're we're in this together. And so we are super excited and just so many things going on. But today we're going to get into our message and uh, really just some things that You might think, well, it's kind of simple, but uh, it is vitally important in the life of a church and in our lives as individuals. So are we ready to go? Let's pray together. Say, God, I'm open. God, I'm ready. Speak to me now. As much as I am excited for the next few months and this next season we're stepping into, uh, have any of you noticed if you came here today or been here the last few weeks that as far as our location here in Fredericton, there's a little bit of inconvenience going on, isn't there? Maybe you all didn't notice that. It, it's like I, I was thinking the other day because I kind of know where we're going and some of you have got used to coming in kind of from the front lawn and I'm like, oh my goodness, a couple weeks they're going to have a whole other way that we get in and people won't know where to even enter the building and, you know, because we're in a building program. And I'm really excited. We've been talking about it for a while and through Legacy and super pumped. Uh, I'm excited to have a connection center. And really that's a big part of what we're doing, an area that when we come in that we can all connect. It's not like we just come in and sit in rows and leave, but actually we can start to do life together even better when we come to this location. I'm excited for new washroom facilities and nursing area for parents. And I'm excited for a youth chapel. Come on, give it up for youth chapel. And and I'm excited for uh, even down the road, we have some new office space above the youth chapel, but that's actually so we can develop and build some or renovate and have some new Hope City kids area, more area for our kids and super, super exciting. But how many of you noticed the first thing that had to be done before we built on? Maybe you just showed up today, and this is your first time back, and you're like, man, when I left, uh, you know, a couple months ago, this place was all together, and now it's kind of tore apart, so you're not quite sure, but how many remember the, the first thing? If you were here, you know, over the last two months, you saw, what was the first thing we had to do? They had to dig down, right? They, 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 they dug down, and, and it was really neat for me to just come and, and walk and actually see the foundation on which we're standing today. That they dug down beside this current building, and, and you can see, as a matter of fact, they, they dug down even a little farther than where our current foundation is. And once they dug down, they, they made sure that the ground was solid, and they came and tested it, and made sure everything was good. And then what did we start to do? We started to build a foundation. That that is the first thing you must do whenever you are going to build something. You've got to make sure that foundation is strong and firm. And the crazy thing about this, all this time, you would say it's the most important part. Guess what they go and do? Cover it all back up. Fill it all in. Like no one can actually see the foundation when it's all done. No one really knows what is going on. We only see the end result, but I'm telling you today, and this is what I want to talk to you about, is if you are going to build anything in life, you have got to make sure the foundation is strong. And so the question we want to talk about today is this, is the 
foundation strong? Look at someone beside you and just ask that question. Is the foundation strong? Is the foundation strong? And as we walk through this today, I, I want you to, to really just in your own heart and your own life, to really be reflecting. And answer this question to yourself today. Is the foundation of your life strong? Is the foundation in your life strong? Is the foundation of your family strong? What are you building your, your family unit on? And thirdly would be this, is the foundation of your church strong? Jesus would talk about this. The scriptures would actually reference foundation in many different times, in many different ways. But Jesus would say these words in Luke chapter 6. He says, as for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show you what they are like. They're like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. Everyone say on rock. When a flood came, the torrent struck that house, but could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. Paul in Ephesians, he's writing in chapter 2 and as he's talking about the fact that we have been made alive in Christ and he, he's pointing out that with, with Christ or in Christ that, that we are all equal. There is no difference. It doesn't matter your background. It doesn't matter the life you lived. He would let us all know both Jew and Gentile have been reconciled to God because of Christ. And then he would say these words, Ephesians 2, 19 to 22. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. Build on the foundation. Everyone say foundation. The foundation of the apostles and the prophets. So he's letting them know, okay, the, we're built on this foundation that, that the prophets, some of the Old Testament, some of the writings that they were pointing towards, that Christ and stuff, that we're built on that. We're, we're built on the apostles' teaching. Those things the po apostles have taught us with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. Everyone say, with Christ Jesus. With Christ Jesus as the chief cornerstone. In him the whole building is joined together and it rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. I, I need you to know this today and I, I'm talking to us in general. And, and I told you some of today was sort of a, a vision day uh, but I, I think you all know, as we look to the future, we sort of try to figure out, okay, God, what, what do you have in store for us? I, I believe the most important thing is the foundation on which we're building. And so often we can get our eyes off the foundation and onto, okay, well, what's next or what's going on? But we must realize how important the foundation is. Do you, do you know what? The health of a church is based on the foundation on which it is built. That, that, that's really how you can, can know the, the health of the church. But, but what's difficult is we've already said it, the foundation is actually stuff you can't really see. I, I had someone, it's actually a staff uh, member this week, they're asking me, you know, they're, they're just kind of going through some stuff in ministry and trying to figure things out. And they were asking me, like, Pastor, how, how do you, like, how do we really gauge that things are going good or, or is successful or, or this and that? And I looked at them and I said, well, you know what? It's actually quite difficult. 
Because we're not just an organization. We're not a business that you just kind of have targets and say, okay, let's hit those targets. Now, there's certain things that we will gauge. There, there's certain things we'll try to measure if we can measure. You know, like, like, yeah, it's great to have a good group together. And, okay, how many people are involved in groups? How many people are taking Alpha? Uh, you know, we, we realize, okay, we'll try to measure what we can. I mean, are people coming out Wednesday and praying? Okay, but the reality is this. is you really cannot gauge the health of a church. Because the reality is this, is you might attend a large church, but you know what? Because you have a large congregation doesn't mean that the church is healthy. You may go to a church that has a large building or maybe they're building on and so you're thinking, wow, this church must be doing really, really good in some ways maybe so, but the reality is this, just because you attend a a gathering in a large building does not mean the church is healthy. Did you know what? That even if you have a, a, a really good kids program and a youth program and a young adults program, it does not mean the church is healthy. Because maybe you say, well, wow, we, we've got some gifted people in our church, and, and wow, I don't mind listening to the pastor preach. I used to fall asleep, but at least I stay awake, and that doesn't mean the church is healthy. You could say the worship, wow, man, look at the talent they have, and look what they're doing. It doesn't mean the church is healthy. Oh, there's certain things we measure, but you know what? The reality is just because you have a church that people love to serve and love week, we come out and love Atlantic and people are serving, but it still doesn't actually mean the church is healthy. When it comes to us as individuals, you know what? Even those of us that have been gifted and use our gifts onto the Lord, maybe even say, for example, the gift of generosity. And you could look at that, and yeah, that's something of the church. Okay, wow, the, the giving's good. And so you could look at that. Well, but the reality is sometimes people are generous because they're trying to hide a whole bunch of other sin in their life. And they think, well, if I can be generous and I give to God, then maybe God will just. Oh, first, first real Sunday of the fall. You didn't know it was going to be this heavy, did you? You didn't realize that when it comes to the life of a church, when it comes to us as individuals, you really cannot look at someone and just know how healthy they are spiritually. We understand that only God really knows the condition of our hearts. Only God. Only God really knows the condition of your heart today. It's why we see throughout Scripture in Timothy, he would write these words, and he's going through some different things, but in chapter 2, verse 19, he says, nevertheless, God's solid, there's that word again, solid foundation, everyone say foundation, stands firm, sealed with this inscription, the Lord knows, someone say knows, the Lord knows those who are his, and everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. There's this whole idea that the foundation the Lord is building, that ultimately it's described like he knows. He actually knows because you attend a church doesn't mean that, oh, wow, I'm doing really good. Even because you might utilize some gifts and they might even be spiritual gifts does not mean you're spiritually healthy. We see it in the Old Testament as the prophet Samuel would come to anoint who would become king. And all he knows is it's the house of Jesse. And so he goes with the anointing oil and they bring them, the sons in one by one, starting with, with the eldest and kind of, okay, this must be king, this must be king, this must be king. And they go through the line, the seven sons, well, where, where, what's going on, God? Where's the one that's anointed? Finally, David comes in. The young, ratty boy barely a teenager. It's here that we see 1 Samuel 16, the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Jesus would actually take it even farther when he was here on earth. 
This is hard sometimes for us to actually grasp because as, as humans, even around church and spiritual things, we, we look at things we're trying to gauge and trying to measure. But Jesus talking about his second coming, which by the way, one day Jesus is coming again. Amen? I, I can't wait next week, homecoming, and, and we're going to be doing a, a little kind of play on the words, but we're going to be talking next week about our home is coming. That, I, that we do have a faith, and it's not just in this life. We believe that one, Jesus, one day Jesus will return. And when you read Scripture, you understand both Old Testament prophecy and the words of Jesus, that when he returns, he will return as judge. He will. And when he was talking to the people before him, the crowds, he, he would let them know. He says this. Uh, I don't think we have it on the screen, but Matthew 7, he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, he's talking about the second coming when he's judging. He says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of the Father who is in heaven. Many will say on that day, But Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name? And in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform miracles. And I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. Wow. You would think, I mean, all of these things that you would say, wow, look, like if you want to find someone that, that's doing really good spiritually, like someone that's praying for people and they're healed and, and, and man, like they, they just, they have it, like God's all over them. And Jesus says, even some of those people and the foundation, something's off. The foundation, I, I'm the one that really knows who is, who is mine. So there's a couple questions that I have for you today. First one is this. I believe it's important as a church, but I, I, the church is made up of individuals. That's what the church is. And so we need to reflect in our own life today. Question number one is this. Are you building on the gospel of Jesus Christ? Look at someone today beside you and just say, are you building on the gospel of Jesus Christ? Like, are you actually building your life on Jesus. E Ephesians will read it again. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people. You're also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. I am telling you something, church. It is vital for our lives as followers of Jesus. It is vital in the life of a church that we make sure over and over and over again that we are building on the foundation of nothing else but Jesus Christ, the good news of our Lord and our Savior. That he came, God in the flesh, that he lived a perfect life, that he died, he laid down his life, he was crucified for our sins. On the third day, he rose again, he ascended into heaven, and one day he will return. I am telling you, church, it is vital that we build our lives on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Build your life on the truth, the truth of who Jesus is. Church, the, the moment, the moment you get away from the, the gospel, the moment you get away from building your life on Jesus Christ, I'm just telling you what Scripture would tell us, what Jesus would tell us, is you're starting to build on something that's not firm, something that's not strong. Something that when life happens and circumstances arise, things are going to come crumbling down. Are you building your life on the gospel of Jesus? The second one would be this. Are you building on the ways of the kingdom? Are you building on the ways of the kingdom? Again, we, in Luke, he says this, as for everyone who comes to me and hears my words, and what? 
puts them into practice. We, we talked about it a little bit last week, but it, it honestly amazes me the amount of people that, that they like to take bits and pieces of Scripture or bits and pieces of stuff that Jesus said, and that's kind of their formation of who Jesus is. And so they'll take little parts and, and kind of like, yeah, I, I like Jesus, and yeah, I want him to be my Savior, and sure, I'll believe on him for my salvation, but they ignore actually all the other things that he said. And I said it last week, something along these lines that, you know what, if you believe on Jesus for salvation, you actually believe he is who he said he was, and you believe the words that he spoke when he let you know, I am the Messiah, I am the one the prophets talked about, and I am going to lay down my life, and only he could forgive us of our sins. You're going to believe all that, but then not believe anything else he taught and said. How can you really believe him for salvation? And so when you're building your life on Christ Jesus as the cornerstone, you actually start to build your life following the ways of the kingdom, the ways that he taught. He taught throughout his life on earth the ways of the kingdom or the gospel of the kingdom. And so you've got to look at your life and say, okay, if I am building my life on Jesus Christ, it's not just that I'm looking at the cross, and okay, he forgave me, now I just live however I want. That's not what Jesus would say. He would say, whoever hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, we're not just hearers of the word, but we are doers of the word also. And so we have to recognize that in building on Jesus Christ, it then flows into us building in the ways of the kingdom. This, this, is, this is an area, man, this is heavy today. You guys doing all right? Sorry I'm getting into so much teaching this morning. I'm not sorry at all. <laughs> sorry, not sorry. This is what can happen, though. It's, it's amazing because sometimes you will have spiritual people, religious people, that end up focusing more on building their life on what they would say would be the law or even the ways of the kingdom, and they actually stop building their life on the gospel of Jesus. And what I mean by that is you can tell if someone is only building their life on the ways of the kingdom or even the teachings of scripture if you start to see some religiosity in their life. You start to see some spiritual pride. You, you start to see the, this sort of like, you know, self-righteous attitude, judgmental spirit towards other people and even other Christians. Because if you truly are building your life, hopefully you follow me, Jesus. I pray in your name that, Lord, what, what you've put in my heart and my mind would come out well in my speech right now. But, but what happens if you aren't building your life on Jesus first, the gospel of Jesus, and you just start to try to build your life on religious practices, you will start to feel prideful. You will start to feel, wow, look how spiritual I am. You will be like the religious people of the day that looked at other people that came to pray and said, oh God, I thank you, I'm not like that person. A spiritual pride will rise up, but if you're building your life first on the gospel of Jesus Christ, no matter how you are now walking in the ways of the kingdom, you are not filled with pride. The more you follow after Jesus and you understand the gospel of Jesus Christ, maybe the better you do in following the ways of the kingdom, it actually fills you with more humility. Because you recognize the only reason I'm able to live like this, the only reason that maybe my life of sin is a little more behind me than it once was, maybe I'm more generous now than I once was, is not because, oh, look how spiritual I am, but you recognize it is solely based on what Jesus Christ has done in your life. And so if you're building your life from the gospel of Jesus and then the ways of the kingdom, you can't get filled with the spiritual pride. It doesn't happen. It 
does not happen. Our foundation is the gospel of Jesus. Our foundation is the ways of the kingdom. And, and I felt to talk about this as the last one today, the last question. Are you building your life on prayer and praise? Obviously, Jesus, the chief cornerstone, you get into following the ways of the kingdom. That's, that's the Bible. That's where we learn the ways of the kingdom. And then the third one, are you building your life on prayer and praise? And, and I put them together today because I, I actually believe in a way they're, they're interchangeable. So sometimes people think of prayer kind of like, well, this is the form of prayer and this is, this is how I pray and this is what prayer looks like. And, and so some people is kind of like, I don't really enter into, you know, praise and worship because I'm really more into prayer. And, and then you'll have other people that are like, you know, I'm really, I love praise and worship. But, you know, they, they're kind of like, well, that praying thing, I don't really know how to do that. Have you ever had that conversation with anyone? Maybe it's because I'm the pastor. I, I have some of those conversations. But the amazing thing that we actually see is that the two of them are somewhat interchangeable. That if you were to read the book of Psalms, anyone ever read some of Psalms? Anyone was here at church through the summer? Right? And, and you, look, you look at Psalms, and essentially the Psalms are prayers, right? That, that's what the Psalms are. But they actually were prayers that were, were written to music, that, that they actually were, were songs, and even throughout church history, they would actually sing some of the psalms, that, that actually this praise idea and prayer is like, okay, this is, this is kind of interchangeable here. Even Jesus, when he taught us the Lord's Prayer, everyone know the Lord's Prayer? Je Jesus, we, we say it's the, the Lord's Prayer, but Jesus was, was really teaching his followers, this is, this is how you can pray. This is a formula for prayer. And, and actually, when you study that, you realize, wow, that even in the Lord's Prayer, it is surrounded by praise, by worship. It begins and it ends with praise. And so we recognize that it is important that we are building our lives on prayer and praise. And so some of you, you need to realize that, you know what? That, that I need to start praising more. Like, I really need to start building my life on, on some true praise. And some of us need to realize how important prayer is in our lives. Some of you need to enter in a little more than you do in praise and worship time. Not just in this house, but in your own house, in your own car. Like, just give God some praise. Every day you wake up, give him praise. That's a form of prayer. But some of you, some of you, you need to start praying in your own words. Pouring your own heart out to God. That it's not the words that someone else got in their alone time with God and their prayer time with God. And they, they started to put it to music and then they recorded it and now we all sing it. You know, when we listen to Spotify, we come together in church. Some of you, you've got to get to the place that I, I'm just talking to God. It's not someone else's experience. It's not someone else's words. It's just me and God. That's why often even in church or especially on a Wednesday night, we'll just say take some time right now and in your own words, start to give God some thanks. Start to give God some praise. You've got to build your life the gospel of Jesus, the ways of the kingdom. You've got to build your life in prayer and praise. Jesus Jesus, one time when he was here on earth, actually probably a couple times, but uh, one time that would be most noted, that he, he showed uh, some righteous anger, we'll say, and I don't even know if there's such a thing as righteous anger, but he was upset. And you know who he was upset with? The religious people. The people that knew, thought they knew all the ways of the kingdom, and we see it through different conversations he would have with them. Well, one day he goes to the temple. And he goes to the temple and he, he is upset. He's upset at what he sees. He's upset at what is going on. And th this is where Jesus actually took out a whip. He's flipping tables. Like, you didn't know that side of Jesus, did you? Some of you were like, wait a minute, I just thought this Jesus. No, like he was upset. This is recorded in, in the scriptures. 
And the reason he was upset what was going on is the people were coming to the temple to offer their sacrifices. Some of you don't know the whole story. You just see, see something. And, and so they're coming to the temple because, again, this was still Old Testament, right? Jesus hasn't died yet. Jesus hasn't paid the price for sins. The New Testament church hasn't begun. So they are following customs of, of the, the Old Testament. And so they're coming to the temple to bring their sacrifices. And what would happen is people would come and they wouldn't have sacrifices. So the religious people had set up shop and they were selling doves and whatever other items were needed for sacrifice. And they were selling them, not just selling them, but selling them for profit. They, they weren't selling church merch to get the word of Jesus out, okay? That's not what was going on. These were, were practices that people had to do, and they were coming and had no money. And the religious people were saying, well, if you're going to make a sacrifice to God, you've got to pay for this somehow. It would be likened today, if, you, if we could have an example whatsoever today, it would be like us coming into church today and people at the door telling us, hey, it's communion day. We're going to take part in communion and we're going to follow the Lord's command and we're going to remember his body and we're going to remember his shed blood and the sacrifice he paid for us on the cross. And by the way, these are for sale for $10. You can't come in today unless you have the, the element and we're going to charge you for this. And, oh, you don't really have money? Oh, well, I'm sorry you can't get in. That's a little bit of maybe how we can understand what is going on. And so Jesus, he lets them know how upset he is because what they have done with the temple, what they have done with true worship, what they have turned it into. And he says these words, it is written. Everyone say, it is written. He said to them, my house, someone say my house, will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. Our foundation is the gospel of Jesus. Our foundation is the ways of the kingdom, and our foundation is prayer and praise. Church, will you stand with me today? I, in my spending time with God and desiring to seek the face of God for myself and for the, the life of the church, I, I just really came back to this, this whole foundation thing. Because In our human hearts and our human minds, we can look at stuff going on and we can think, well, the church is doing great. But the church is only doing as good as you are doing as an individual. That's the reality. We're all part of the church, we are the church. And, and what can happen so often, especially you step into a building program and legacy offering so good, is people can actually have this sense, wow, look how good the church is doing. And it's why I felt in my spirit to tell you today and tell all of us or remind us that it doesn't matter what is built. It doesn't even matter the amount of people that show up. It doesn't matter any of that. What does matter is that we're constantly digging back down and looking at the foundation. Amen. Making sure that everything is all right. That what we're building upon is actually solid, sustainable. First Peter chapter 2. Starting in verse 4, he says, You are coming to Christ, who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. He was rejected by people, but he was chosen by God for great honor. And you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. What's more, you are his holy priests. 
Through the mediation of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifices that praise God. As the scriptures say, I am placing a cornerstone in Jerusalem, chosen for great honor, and anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Yes, you who trust him recognize the honor God has given him, but for those who reject him, the stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. And he is the stone that makes people stumble The rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they do not obey God's word. And so they meet the fate that was planned for them. But, look at someone and say, but. But. You are not like that. For you are a chosen people. Someone say, I'm chosen Look your neighbors say, you're chosen. For you are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. This is what I love about the truth of God's word. And if you build on solid foundation, and if that means you have a building, or that means you have a building program, or that means a whole bunch of people are showing up at, at once, or whatever that means, or it means you're in a small community and you've got a small little group in a small building, or, or you're in a field somewhere, that really doesn't matter. All that matters is you're building on a solid foundation. And then it says this. As a result, it was say in a loud voice, as a result, as a result, you can show others the goodness of God. For he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. What I'm saying is this, is that when you are building on the proper foundation in your life as an individual, parents and your family at home, which results in a church being built on the proper foundation, when you're being built on the proper foundation, you don't have to worry about the world seeing the light of Jesus shining through your life. It's what the results will be. It's not the programs that are run. It's not the building that's going on. I told someone the other day, I said, God God knew me. And everyone sometimes complains about, they say, our property, our church building. This one, before I was here in 1980, I was in Mama's womb, uh, 79, when this place was first getting constructed and people say man we built the church backwards it's like should have been up on the hill and you know so parking everyone can see it full and this and that and we're now in a building program and I told someone the other day I said God just knew one day I'd be leading this thing and I'm just the type of person maybe I don't talk to you enough about the building program because like I, I'm kind of glad it's on the backside and no one sees it. <laughs> it's like people drive by they don't know nothing's happening here they, they don't know because I, I'm just like it's not about a building it's just not. Like, I don't get all excited because a building's being built. But I do get excited about people building their lives on the foundation of Jesus Christ, following the ways of the kingdom. People that are filled with prayer and praise, and as a result, as a result, people are seeing Jesus. They're seeing Christ shine through our lives. the reason we always say Wednesday night is the most important gathering we have as a church is because we we just say that's an hour in the middle of the week we're just going to come and praise and pray and it always looks different in the format we we never know what we're going to do for sure week to week but we just love to come together we believe that's where the power of God is on it straight straight up and and I know I'm not I'm not trying to because we some people travel so far to come here together with us on Sundays and you're praying wherever you are but but if I the the as far as for me I'm just being honest uh, if I was to look at a crowd in a service I'd probably get most excited about the crowd that would show up for a prayer time it's just it, it, I, I heard someone say this just recently 
Um, it was a story about a, a pastor, an older pastor, and it was some conference, and a younger pastor came in, and he came into the service late, and he goes to the pastor, and he, he says, oh, pastor, he said, I, I didn't make it here for the praise and worship. I, I was a little late, but man, I got here for the best part. I, I got here for the most important part. I got to hear you teach the word of God. And the older pastor looked at him and said, well, what do you mean the best part? The best part for who? And the young preacher looked at him and said, well, well, what do you mean the best part for who? He said, well, just that. Like you say, the word, the teaching of the word is the best part. The best part for who? He said, the teaching of the word, yes, is the best part for you because you need the word of God in your life. But he said, the reality is the best part for God is that prayer and worship time that we start the service with. God doesn't need the word. He is the word. Like he, he doesn't get a whole lot out of the teaching in that moment. You do. You get fed from the word, but, but you actually miss the most important part to God. And that is just when you're shutting everything else off and you're just focusing on him and giving him glory and honor. This has been my prayer, and this is what I see more than any programs and more than anything. I... But whenever, whenever you sense that you see something in the Spirit, it, it still is dependent on the people responding. And... And so what, what, I, what I see is what, what I believe God would desire what could be if we started to build the foundation properly. But I, but I feel so strong in this next season. This, this whole idea of family ministry. And... As I've been praying, even as I would look on Sundays and especially even our Wednesday gatherings or whatever it looks like, but maybe this is even as much a challenge as anything. Where are the dads that are in the room? Raise your hand. Dads that are in the room. It's time for some of you dads to step up. And start leading your family spiritually. If you truly believe the word of God. You truly believe in Jesus. The most important thing for your family and your household. Is that they are being built on the foundation. Of Jesus Christ. I, my, my challenge, I'm not, I'm not putting down, there, there are some amazing mothers here today. I, I'm not, like, you are doing, you are leading well. You're doing an amazing, amazing job. But, but I, I've just felt in my spirit that, that it is time for some dads that have kind of taken a back seat to leading their family towards spiritual things. That, that if you would start to take a stand, some, some of you just are complaining about everything going on in the world and you don't like it at all and this and that. Let me just tell you something. The greatest thing you can focus on is your family unit, your household. We say it today, I plead the blood over my family, my children. So, so, some dads, so, some of you, you don't even have prayer time and Bible reading with your children. Yet you want your children growing up loving Jesus Christ and serving Him. You want them to be saved. Yet when it comes to spiritual things, the only thing they see is mom and dad saying, okay, it's time for church Sunday morning. Is that building a firm foundation? Like what would Wednesday nights look like if mom and dad walked in the room with their three children? said, hey kids, we're just going to spend an hour of prayer time and worship time together as a family. No, there's not a kids program. No, there's not a youth program. We're all just going together. We're going to just pray together. Oh God. Right now, just, just close your eyes. 
the, the Lord is in this room and he's speaking to our hearts right now. Jesus, we pause in this moment to hear from you. Jesus, I believe that you want to do great and mighty things through our lives. Lord, I believe that you want to do great and mighty things through us as a collective gathering, a church. But God, ultimately that will only happen is if individual, as individuals we're digging down and making sure the foundation is solid. God, it, it happens when as a family unit we're digging down and making sure the foundation is solid. And God, as a church, we're constantly remembering. This is you. This is you that's building the church. It's you, Jesus. And so as a church, we've got to dig down and make sure the foundation is strong. going to right now just just encourage you uh, they'll bring the lights back up service isn't isn't done I, I ask you don't rush out but I, I believe there's some people that you need to yes you can do it at your seat but I, I believe right now there's some people that you just need to before you leave we talked about prayer but some of you you need to get out of your seat and just just make your way to the front of the room get on your knees or maybe on your knees at your seat but I, I think we just need to have a moment a few moments of just us talking to God of us talking to God today is that, I, just a bunch of you right now just, just start they're not singing yet I know but just out of your seat and just, just come to the front you just say yeah no I, I want to spend some time talking to God so some dads right now just, just you, you need to your prayer needs to be God help me to, to lead my family help me to lead my family in what is most important God I, I want to make sure I'm building my life on solid foundation I want to I want to make sure my family's being built on solid foundation. Even as a church, we, we come together and we come, we pray, we say, God, we, we pray that our church would, would not ever get distracted, would not ever get off course, that we would be building as a church on the solid foundation of Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus. Jesus. Come on, church, let's pray. Christ is my Jesus, in your name, Jesus. In 